So I would like to thank the instrumental organizations and individuals without whom this event would not have happened. First of all, the Chicago Architecture Biennial for their generosity in selecting ArcAgenda LLC as an affiliate program partner. Also, Neil Katz, if you would stand up, please. The reason Neil Katz is very special, he's a former colleague at SOM and Harrington College of Design. He's a member of the Chicago-based computational design group SOM Black Box, but he was also the person that helped me brainstorm this event. So thank you, Neil, and thank you, everyone at SOM, for being here. And most importantly, I want to thank our wonderful speakers, who truly do not need an introduction, but I am going to introduce them, um, as global thought leaders and provocateurs. I would like to bring your attention to the backside of your program. So there were programs all over the seats. <clears throat> For the next exciting adventure that Arc Agenda is going to do, we are sponsoring a global competition to design Lieberland, the 21st century micronation. Please visit the website and enter this exciting ideas competition, which we're also working very hard to make an actual built reality. This venue, the Gold Room, is notoriously known as the most haunted in Chicago. The hotel was built in 1893 for the Columbian Exposition and since has been sworn by many guests as being very haunted. This haunting is entirely appropriate for the Archagenda debates since these guests are some of the most notorious voices haunting architecture today. <laughs> and more viscerally for myself, their projects and practices have haunted my entire career in architecture. Obviously, they are very appreciated for that. Since I strongly feel that they need no extensive introduction, I will very briefly state the various roles that these globally celebrated architects play in the field of architecture, urbanism, and design, and the order in which they are presenting. They all share the commonality of being architects, theorists, and educators. Patrick Schumacher, is a partner at Zaha Hadid Architects, where he has been since 1988. He is also the founding director of the Architectural Association's Design Research Laboratory, where he still teaches today among other prestigious schools all over the world. He has written the treatise, The Autopoiesis of Architecture, in two volumes, a most impressive feat in comprehensive unified theory. Peter Eisenman is the founder of Eisenman Architects and has been active in both practice and academia for 50 years. He's a professor at Yale and he has taught at very notable institutions including UIC when I was a student and he served as an honorary chair of the Department of Architecture. He's the author of Writing into the Void, Selected Writings from 1990 to 2004. Jeffrey Kipnis is an architectural critic, designer, filmmaker, curator, and theorist. He is the founder of the Architectural Association's Graduate Design Program and a professor at Knowlton School of Architecture at Ohio State University. He's the author of A Question of Qualities, Essays in Architecture. Rainier de Graaf, whose name I've botched off just now, um, is a partner at the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, OMA, director of AMO, OMA's research and design counterpart, and co-author of the celebrated Roadmap 2050, a practical guide to a prosperous, low-carbon Europe. Theodore Spiropoulos is the founding partner of Minif Minima Forms, along with his brother, Stephen, and the current director of the Architectural Association's Design Research Laboratory. He's the author of the innovative book, Adaptive Ecologies, Correlated Systems of Living. My own role in this event is as curator, talk show host, and moderator with a very light touch. I expect a lot of participation from everyone here, and these debates are for all of us a communication event. The event is being filmed, so no other film or audio is allowed, certainly no flash. The ARC Agenda debates will be held in two rounds. After each group speaks and delivers their individual 20-minute position papers, we will have a one-hour public debate with audience participation, and I hope that you make my job easy by asking all the good questions. There will be one 15-minute intermission between sessions, and the event will end at 9.30, and we have 45 minutes leeway if we want to socialize with our guests. The issues that haunt architecture today span a huge gamut and stylistic identity. 
This is perhaps the most accelerated age in design, empowered by computation and global real-time communication, and yet we're all faced with far-reaching battles of ideas that are straining the continuous fabric of our discourse and practices in both fertile and unfertile directions. In the most general manner, the ARC Agenda debates aim to tease out these conflicts and actually work through them to the extent permitted by the brevity of this event. To inaugurate a new level of communication that may someday soon facilitate the movement towards a unified, coherent discourse. I now welcome our first speaker, Patrick Schumacher, who is perhaps the most outspoken proponent of this particular social function of architecture. Please help me welcome him. Thank you, Daniela, and welcome everybody. So I will do a quite rapid staccato style presentation within 20 minutes. And then I'm sure you'll have a lot of time to pick apart some of these points and elaborate upon them. Um, I think the arch agenda debates are hitting the nail on the where the uh, task of trying to formulate maybe through debates and uh, collective discourse where the discipline should be going, where it is, and where it might go, should go. And I don't, we don't get much help from this, just to let me preface this, from the Chicago Architecture Biennale, because I just been to the exhibition yesterday and there was virtually next to nothing which I recognize as relevant contemporary architecture. So we have to fill that void here, perhaps. Uh, the state of the art of architecture, <clears throat> I think it is, we're in an interesting position at the cusp of a tr significant transformation of the global built environment. And so the future of the art of architecture looks uh, bright and I've currently editing a new issue of AD called Parametrism 2.0, where it is just about trying to define that, trying to gather what is relevant with respect to the future of architecture. And some of the speakers are invited actually to contribute to this also. Before I go into the substantive arguments, I want to uh, make a few meta-arguments about the imperative of convergence, the importance of these debates, because I believe that the discipline must strive to define and share, uh, define a shared paradigm, its agenda, its direction, the way forward, and I think that's a singular way forward, because otherwise we would be uh, standing in each other's way in the attempt to define the metropolis of the 21st century. So the purpose or end game of architectural discourse is consensus around a shared paradigm as a precondition of cooperative, cumulative progress towards a global best practice. So that simultaneous or sequential acts do not contravene each other. So there is an imperative of coherence, which implies the rejection of pluralism. So we can only accept pluralism as temporary historical condition during periods of crisis-induced paradigm shifts, and the last one was the 1980s, where that kind of pluralism was inevitable. And at that time, we had to reckon with the temporary divergences and temporary pluralism of directions with the whole purpose of kind of sifting through, selecting out, and, and forging a way forward. So we have to reject the fatalistic acceptance of a pluralism of ineradicable or insurmountable condition of postmodernity, if you like. So I think we need to shift gear with respect to our uh, discursive culture, and that was also a kind of quote of mine at the very beginning and, uh, of, of the art agenda provocation. I think we should kind of work from a benign intolerance, I would like to call it, as a discursive strategy and mechanism of convergence. So the principle of indiscriminate tolerance that makes sense only in a phase of post-crisis brainstorming um, if it had made, would be made permanent, and I, we are in the danger of doing that, ultimately denies the possibility of the comparative evaluation of positions, paradigms, and styles. So, and thus, ultimately denies the discipline's rationality, denies the possibility of coherent progress. 
And so, but this is a historicizing argument. Um, discourse cultures are not absolute, but must be reflected and adjusted in line with historical junctures and tasks. So I believe we need to sheer, uh, shift gear. I mean, it's in fact long overdue and uh, implement a shift also in the cast of characters, role models, ambitions, etc. So I'm announcing the, that the days of the iconoclast mavericks are over. And I'm not sure some of the panel asked would be, have to be classified in that category. I'll leave that for the further debate to unfold. So um, I believe that in order for the discipline to get a chance to once more affect the pervasive impact and transformation of the built environment, we must transform the discursive culture, as said, uh, at this juncture and increase the polemical force and insistence, both internally within parametrism and also externally. Uh, and weed out the ignorance which persists in the face of a by now, I would argue, mature and compelling set of best practice principles. So, and therefore, we must vigorously challenge any self indulgent withdrawal from critical debate in the name of artistic freedom, which we needed in the 80s, in fact, because at that time, modernism was bankrupt and there wasn't a clear way forward. That we had to go through a draw in philosophy and have a kind of very, very wide open debate. But that open debate, obviously, is the whole purpose of it is to, to come to conclusions, to, to, add, uh, to find a new way, and that the new way has been found. And we're working on it cumulatively already for 15, 20 years. So we have been, I would argue, up to 2008, in a period of post-convergence, cumulative mature, mature research and development under the auspices of parametric design, with an increasingly large-scale implementation of parametrism across all continents and program domains. And the work of Zadid Architects is exemplifies this, but this was going on until the Great Recession put the brakes on and diverted attentions and energies. And so we, to some extent, what happened, maybe it's inevitable the politicization and the opening up of big questions once more, but I think that simultaneously we have to get back on track and we need a new level of assertiveness, I believe. Uh, we need to win the arguments about how architecture can best contribute to societal progress. I mean, and parametrism has to win these arguments. I have to win this argument. We have to collectively address this. And that has not always been uh, within the movement a, a, a priority, but in the co co current context must be a priority and answers have been provided uh, in the last year. So this assertiveness must be backed up by a compelling substantive set of arguments. Basically, it requires a demonstration of parametrism's compelling superiority in terms of its life-enhancing advantages, its kind of societal project, and we need to claim that from within parametrism. So what this also demands of us is a framing worldview. So we need architectural theory, and architecture, since in a sense, always was backed up and worked through this theory, and, but it also needs an architectural theory that is embedded within an up-to-date social science and theory of society. And there's a number of candidates we can look at and study, and architectural theorists, we don't expect that from every architect, but architectural theorists who have a, make a claim for leading the discipline uh, uh, need to scan s the social science and theory of society and make a, a bet, a bit, and I picked up Luhmann as one of a series of potential candidates for uh, the state of the art of social science and theory. And, in the conference two years ago, which the book is now out, I made the argument of the historical pertinence of parametrism and uh, argued for a prospect of a free market urban order, which I will also go into uh, in the next few minutes. So this is uh, my position statement. I don't want to re repeat it. And we, start, we have to really start very deeply at f fundamental uh, issues. What is the built environment's contribution to society? What has it been? And I believe that social order required spatial order, that we have uh, the built environment as the necessary material substrate of cultural and societal evolution. There is no society without built environment for a reason. It's basically becoming human through building up society and building up on a scale beyond the kind of flock of apes roaming through the forests. We need built environment as a substrate of cumulatively building up social structure, social order, embed and stabilize and evolve social institutions through uh, spatial orders, morphologies, but also, as you can see here, with the semiological overlay. And that doesn't only include the built environment, it includes the, the whole world of artifacts and products, including the fashion system, the world of artifacts. All of that is a ordering stratum which evolves 
and builds up, and initially through trial and error, it's a kind of non unreflected process of accumulating a social societal uh, uh, systems at this stage, for instance, there is a certain, the medieval uh, uh, feudal town. This spreads across the landscape as really a winning, a winning uh, um, um, model. But then it evolves further, and we have the Big Bang of architecture, where there is an emergence of a new substance or substrate of architectural and therefore cultural social evolution, where we have a reflective discourse where we move from direct trial error out in the, in, in the, in, in the real world of construction into the domain of the drawing and, and, and discourse and argument, and that accelerates innovation, and that projects now in a series of much faster evolving trajectories uh, back in a fast evolving society, because we also at the same time have political theory, we, we have the sciences and a theory of technologies, everything becomes onto that new stratum of evolution which is the writing discourse. And that I'm just moving through and as you can see here the Baroque is far more superior than the Renaissance uh, in, in constructing larger integrated social holds and make them legible and orient social actors within a much more complex and deep society and moving on through his neoclassical historicism into the modernist era, the, the, the mass industrial society, world society emerges and it has a, again a new series of uh, um, organi organizing principles, um, uh, more differentiation, more degrees of freedom, the overcoming of uh, for instance uh, system and proportionality but this too finds its limits and wasn't a big mistake but it would have been a mistake to continue because we're moving forward, we have the micro revolution, we have a much more rich and diversified and dynamic societal environment and we need to move from the left to the right and that's the states as we are now. We have new degrees of freedom and we have um, uh, the answer to this new stage of civilization which I call post for network society is parametricism and it's not yet impacted. It's just a proposition, starts to be impacted in isolated cases but we need to move forward and it become an all-encompassing model. And we, what we need to do is we need to realize that the uh, architectural styles are epochal styles which align with socioeconomic epochs and that the progression of styles has its raison d'etre in the process of uh, societal and civilatory progress and evolution, also in steps and stages, not as a kind of smooth continuation. And that's the condition where we are now. We all know, in, we feel in our bones that we have to be in these mega, cities, we have urban concentrations of an unprecedented scale and we all need to be in these centers and they become super dense and super complex, super rich, multi-audience and that's what we need to address. The problem is, yes, this is much more superior to the kind of modernist, clean, separate or city but at the same time it has a problem. It is menacing visual chaos. There's nothing but ugliness, I would call it the garbage spill urbanization, which, which was happened in, since the 1970s, you can say, or 60s in fact. The 60s were the last beautiful urban districts, whether it's Brasilia or, or, or white Tel Aviv. Or, so ever since we have only this kind of garbage spill active ugliness, it is vital and intense, there's nothing else. It's been aestheticized in postmodernism and deconstructors in particular. And now where will we go from there? We have these kind of amorphous spills uh, disfigured, disorienting, but intense and attracting. The only things which, which, which become legible and make sh give shape and orientation is in fact the river. Some natural features, valleys, mountains. So I'm saying let's run with that. That's an intuition to build on. So we can use the principles of nature of a lawful rule-based um, structuration of a complex variegated order of a highly differentiated intricate and complex system but we need to uh, we can do that and emulate through algorithms through what the, the, the tools and, and topics of parametrism so what we do here we have urban parametric urbanism models we move from single author to multi-author projects and basically here what it is the the the, the urban texture builds up where each subsystem or intervention project is like a new, totally unpredicted, totally free, endless form uh, species, which, which is created by an architect, but it is always a species with rules, with scripts, with algorithms, which settle and nestles into this. And with the, with, within parametrism, it evolves a past dependent new urban identity and order, which has the, the degrees of freedom we need, but new ordering capacities, uh, which, 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 elevators out of that, that chaos. So what I'm saying here is that parametrism is the, the superior style. There's a trajectory of history where we actually have this 
in the necessary degrees of freedom we needed to address the new, the versatility of, of contingencies and, and differentiation of an evolving society, was came along with the degradation of ordering capacity. So when we left classicism behind, we lost symmetry and proportion. Uh, yeah, great. And, um, and uh, so, so uh, when we lost modernism behind, we, we lost seriality and orthogonality, and we have an increase in degrees of freedom, but a degeneration of order. And here we have a turning point with folding and parametrism where we have further degrees of freedom. We have now splines and nerve surfaces, uh, gradients, which none of these prior styles have. So we have much more versatility. At the same time, we have much more order, ordering capacity through associative logic. So and just goes to some of the projects, what it means we can do address very, very complex, multi-level, multi-trajectory, multi-entry, multi-institutional, multi-audience sites and give them coherence, give them flow, give them navigation um, and give them uh, a kind of space which has principle and law and a 360 degree interface of information with interface of communication above, below, and all around. Off, give all the offerings of society at our fingertips, but not in, in chaos, but in according rule and rhyme and navigability. So this is what we deliver, uh, these kind of space of simultaneity, but structured order through, through algorithmic principles. And uh, we do that across all uh, domains. And the final aspect, and, and this could be also uni interior urbanism of a huge scale, orientation, hundreds of offerings simultaneously pre present and made available. Now, how do we demonstrate this? How do we work this through in terms of the programmatic? We need to go to crowd modeling. We need to replace labels which designate programs, really model these life processes, parametrically variable event scenarios through agent-based uh, parametric crowds, and we can do that by uh, also embedding now and in, in making these crowds information sensitive. These are semiologically charged environments, so there's a semiological overlay which the agents are responsive to. Now we can experiment and understand the meaning of very, very strange and intense configuration because we can model what it means. The meaning is, of course, the behavioral uh, codes and rules which, which then emerge uh, over all event patterns which, which can have a name. And that's the paradigm, the way we're demonstrating what this means sociologically, how the, uh, the complexity which we're craving for makes eminent sense. It's not a waste. It's not a kind of um, uh, meaning, meaningless exuberance, but an instrumentality of architecture on a new level of sophistication, which brings in big data, brings in all the engineering sophistications, and with a series of uh, 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 criteria of success, which are homing in on the soci societal programmatics and, and, and uh, so social functionality we need to address and uh, work through. So these are lead to an innovation in the agent setup, which isn't in current crowd modeling as engineering crowds, it's just evacuating, but we, we have to model sociologically sensitive and charged up environments and can innovate, for instance, with new institutions where a lecture kind of peters out into, into a, a homeostasis, into an into event space. And we make the architecture itself becomes agent, active agent, responsive with its own artificial intelligence, interacting with human agents, and we have this kind of uh, flexibility and openness, but yet relevancy and, and specificity of event uh, uh, interaction which, 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 which constitutes society. And I'll just flick through these and I think you get the message and meaning of where the global best practice is. Those who don't invest in these skills are left behind. It's like um, uh, insisting on using a postal service instead of social media. As, as, a, as, net, uh, as a system of communication. That's where we at, that's where we have to be, that should be in this, in this show, that should be on everybody's mind. And these are the kind of true criteria of success which architecture has to be uh, uh, delivering towards. So the demonstration of superior social functionality, compelling best practice, style and methodology. So that's my proposition. And it's very mature, it's very compelling, and I will, I will, I will argue this in detail with you later. Thank you.